Father, I pray, Lord, I, even as I speak your word, Lord, let it not be my words, O oh God, but Lord, let it be the words that you want to speak to us through your Holy Spirit, to our hearts and our souls, O oh God. Today, I pray you will speak very personally to every one of us, Lord. Encourage those who are discouraged, O oh God. Strengthen those who are weak. Lord, anoint those, O oh God, who need your anointing power to continue doing what they are doing for you, O oh God. And Lord, I pray that we will leave this place, O oh God, not the way we came. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our worship team who led us into the very presence of God this evening. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, what I uh, enjoyed very specially about today, uh, I mean, I enjoy every day's worship, but today's worship in particular, is the fact that, um, you know, the awesomeness of God. In fact, I was left uh, at the end of the worship session with just awe for God. God is holy, amen. And sometimes when you look at everything that's happening around the world, it's easy to get discouraged. But the holiness of God speaks of a God who is in control of all things. Nothing is out of his hands. He's awesome. He's holy. In fact, the word holy means a cut above almost. So when you say holy, 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 he's like above everything and everyone else. His love is holy means that his love is beyond any human love that we can ever experience. His power is holy means that his awesome in power is and holiness is that his power is beyond anything that we could ever experience or expect. God is good, amen? So today we are back in Genesis. Uh, we are going to look at Genesis chapter 8, okay? So if you remember last week, we, we did a very different service, but today we are, going, we are coming back to the book of Genesis. And as we study the book of Genesis, I want you to learn something from the structure of today's text. Actually, today's text is just one verse, but I want you to learn from the structure of what comes before it and what comes after it. See, Moses, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has introduced into this text something that is called a chiastic structure. Okay, that is a way of teaching. A way of teaching and pointing he has structured the text in such a way that it kind of starts out and comes in so from before okay from genesis 6 9 all the way to genesis 8 22 is this classic structure and you see that from both the ends from 6 9 to 8 22 the scriptures come in in a pattern almost like a mirror image of each other on either side of the central text, and it comes down and meets at the point that God wants us to focus at. Okay? So for some of you that is like, what in the world is he talking about? I will show it to you on the screen. Okay, so the first half describes from 6, 9 all the way up um, to about the end of chapter 7, talks about the decreation of the earth. In other words, God's judgment the flood, and all that happened, okay? And then you get verse 8, and from verse 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, and then from that onwards, you find how God recreates the world by the flood waters receding and Noah, you know, coming out of the ark and all that needs to happen. So uh, I have this up on the screen, um, and let's just see. Okay, so the first one, yeah, if you just stop there, it says Genesis 6, no, if you go back one, yeah, Genesis 6, 11 to 13 is how God resolves to destroy the earth. He looks at the earth and says, listen, evil is so much that I have uh, decided to destroy the earth. And if you go all the way down to 8, 21 to 22, is when the Lord resolves never to destroy the earth with a flood again. So he resolves to destroy the earth with a flood on one end, and the other end, he never resolves to, he resolves never to destroy the earth with a flood. Then if you go to the next one, is Genesis 6, 14 to 22. Noah builds the ark according to God's instructions. And if you go down, Genesis 8, 20, Noah builds an altar. 
Okay, so Noah is building in the next one. And if you go to the next, um, Genesis 7, 1 to 9, God commands Noah and his family and the animals and everything else to enter the ark. If you go down, in 8, 15 to 19, God commands Noah and his family and all the animals to leave the ark. So you see this pattern, and that's what you call a chiastic structure, okay, or chiasm. And Genesis 7 to 16, it says, God opens the windows of heaven, okay, in uh, Genesis 10, 16, um, 7, 10 to 16. You see, God opens the windows of heaven and it rains, and it rains for 40 days. And if you go down, um, Noah opens the windows of the ark, and the earth dries up, and the rain stops for 40 days. And that's in Genesis 8, 6 to 14. If you go to the next one. In Genesis 7, 7 to 24, the flood prevails for 150 days and the mountains are covered. And if you come down one, the flood recedes for 150 days and the mountains are visible. Can you see this? Coming down from either side. And where it meets, okay, the central text is that text. That's where God wants us to focus. And that's where, when Noah was writing this, he's saying, this is what I want y'all to really focus on. And let's see what that text is. Then God remembered Noah. That's the text that we are going to study today about what happens or what does it mean when God remembered. When God remembered Okay, Genesis 8.1 says, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. So the first thing I want to uh, say is that when God remembers, God remembers his covenant and the promises of his covenant, his covenant promises. That's the first point if you're taking down points. So what does it mean, God remembered. Now, in English, and sometimes in the Greek, in the New Testament Greek, the word remembered usually means a mental exercise, okay? It is a, a mental recollection or an intellectual exercise. It is to recall or retain information. So if I tell you remember something, it means for you to either go back and recall something that was said to you, or to retain the information that I'm giving you. So I say, remember that next week we are going to do this program. It is for you to retain that information. So in that context, if we take it like that, to mean God remembered in that context, then God remembered Noah means that Noah and his family were adrift in the waters for about 190 days by this point. And all of a sudden God says, oh my goodness, I forgot. I left Noah in the waters. Okay, and that's what it means to remember. No, obviously that's not what it means when it says God remembered Noah. Because in the Hebrew, the word for remember is zakhar, okay? And the word conveys a deeper meaning than just recalling something or bringing, retaining some information. The word zakhar often implies a significant, purposeful action in response to the act of remembering. In other words, it means not just to bring something into mind, it is to act accordingly. Okay, it is to act. It's an action word. Zahar is an action word. And it's not just a mental recalling, because it often involves a response. When the Bible says God remembered, he doesn't just bring things to mind and says, oh, now I remember what happened. He acts accordingly. So when God remembers something, okay, it means he takes all the promises. So when the Bible says God remembers you, it means he takes all the promises in relation to you or whatever situation there is, and he brings it to the now, to the present. He brings it to past. That's what it means. So in Genesis 6, 18, God told Noah, I've established my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, your sons, wives with you and all that. God gives him a promise and God says, listen, this is what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood because of the wickedness, but I'm going to save your family, and I'm going to make a covenant with you. So when Genesis 8.1 says, then God remembered Noah, it means God acted on his behalf. It means God remembered means the promise, the covenant promise God made in the past. God in a specific time, in a specific way, brings it to pass. See, remember, God has a way, God has a time, God has a purpose in your life and in everything he says he's going to do. He doesn't just throw out his promises. He is very specific. And when he tells you something, there is a time and a way he achieves it. When he anointed David to be a king, he didn't just say, okay, you're a king, and from now on, just take over. There was a time and a way he brought it to pass. And sometimes that time and way is not how you and I would want it to come to pass. It is God's way, it is God's time, and it's God's purpose. Interestingly, who is writing all this in Genesis, as I've always told you, is Moses. He's writing this to the children of Israel. And he's letting them know that when God remembered Noah, is no different to when God remembered them. And you find this in Exodus 2, verse 23 to 25. It says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. This, once again, does not mean that the children of Israel for 400 years was in Egypt, and they were suffering and going through whatever they went through, and God just had forgotten about them because he had so much other business to take care of, and he was doing something in another part of the world, and suddenly came back and said, oh, I remember you, I heard your voice, now I remember you. That's not what, was, what, what it is saying. It is saying that when God remembered uh, the children of Israel, that God was working out his purpose for them, and at that specific time and in a specific way, God was going to bring about his covenant promises to his people. And that's what Genesis, 15, uh, Genesis tells us. And what are these covenant promises? You find them in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 to 14, and then verse 16 and 18 to 19. I'm just jumping through because that's a long passage there. It says, Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land, that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. So God says, listen, your people are going to be in this foreign land, in this dark place, for over 400 years. And also the nations whom they serve, I will judge afterwards. They shall come out with great possession. He says, but I'm going to bring them out, blessing them tremendously. I'm going to bring them out. And at the same time, I'm going to judge those who treated them badly. And this is, what he's, this is the promise to Abraham. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. Here means Canaan, the promised land. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And then you go on to verse 18 and 19 and it says, On that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given the land. So God says, here, this is my promise to Abraham. There's going to be some dark times for your people. You're going to be taken captive, taken into a land for 400 years. Not captive. You're going into a land, and you're going to be there for 400 years. Things are not going to be great. You're going to be mistreated. And when you're mistreated, I'm going to come and judge them, and I'm going to deliver you. He says that. And then he says, I'm going to bring you out and give you the promised land. And that is the promise that God fulfilled when he said, and God remembered his people, the promise or the covenant to Abraham. This is the covenant that God remembered. And this is the covenant that God brought to pass. So when it says God remembered, it means God acts on your behalf 
but he acts on your behalf according to his covenant promises to you. So it's not presumptive prayer. It's not by just saying, God, this is what I want, and this is what I want you to do. It's God, bring your promises and your purposes and your will into my life. That's what it is. So what should we do? As children of God, what should we do? When you look at the prayers of the Old Testament and New Testament saints in the Bible, you will see a very familiar pattern in the way they prayed. Okay, I'm going to look at two prayers very quickly. Uh, from uh, Moses and Nehemiah. If you look at the life of Moses, Moses prays this prayer. Moses had gone up to the mountain. He'd been there uh, Mount Sinai. He'd been there with God. Meanwhile, down at the foot of the mountain were his people who were worshipping idols, worshipping a golden calf, and, and they were just rebelling against God. When Moses comes down, he is pretty mad. He's upset. He's so angry that he actually, later on, he grounds that golden calf into dust, and he makes the people drink it. Okay? Now, that's how angry he was. Okay? But at the same time, God says... Listen, I'm going to destroy these people, Moses, because they're stiff-necked. They're, used, I mean, they're not obeying me. They're rebelling, grumbling, murmuring about me. And I'm going to start a new people from you. And listen to Moses' prayer in Exodus 32, verse 13 to 14. He says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. We were at a, a worship retreat la, uh, yesterday, a uh, worship team re uh, retreat yesterday, and um, we were talking about some stuff, and then Shari came up with something I thought was really, really amazing. Um, uh, an insight that she brought, and she said about Moses, or actually she was talking about Aaron and, and Moses, when God was about to judge the people, he ran into the midst of the crowd with incense, and he actually averted the, the, the judgment. But what she said, what, what was interesting was, is that they agreed with God on the judgment that needed to come to the people. But yet they prayed that God will avert his judgment upon them. And this is what Moses is doing. He's angry with the people. He's saying, you guys need to be judged. But God don't judge them. And I was almost like, why would you pray prayer like If you agree that these people need to be judged, and I'm not talking about this side of the room, <laughs> okay, why would you tell God, don't do it? You would probably say, yeah, God, they really need some judgment. But here God, they're saying, don't do it. And I realized that that is the heart of God. That's the heart of Jesus. Jesus agreed with the judgment of God upon the people. He is God, by the way. But yet he died to avert the judgment from the people. And that's the heart of God. And that's the heart of Moses here. And sometimes you see such wickedness happening in the world. You just think, God, maybe you should judge these people. And you think... Maybe not, God. Maybe not, God. Not now. Avert your judgment. Have mercy on them. And by the way, that's kind of what Moses is praying, but that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is this. Moses tells God, remember your covenant. God, this is your promised people. No matter how mad you are with them, remember your covenant and don't judge them. Don't destroy them. See, the, the, the saints of old would always pray and say, remember God of the covenant and the promises that you have made. And sometimes it seems a very bold prayer to say, God, remember. God never forgets. God cannot forget. Well, you say, well, the Bible says God forgets your sins. That's a different way that he forgets. It's not like the, every time you repent of your sin, you say, I've done this, I have lied or cheated, and then you say, God, forgive me. God takes your sin and erases it and throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. And next time you go to God and say, God, 
you know what, I've sinned again and I've, I've lied and I've cheated again. And God says, what? You did? I really can't remember you doing that before. That's not the context here. What it means that he forgets is he does not act against your sin. Okay? It's the same thing as he remembering means he acts on your behalf. So once again in Nehemiah, you see this once again in Nehemiah 1.8-9. Nehemiah is praying and he says, remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses. He's saying, God, remember what you told Moses. And this is what you told Moses. If you are faithful, I will scatter you among, uh, unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the furthest parts of the heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. So he says, by this point, Nehemiah and Israel had been sacked Nehemiah and some of the people were exiles in, in Babylon and, and uh, Nehemiah is praying and saying, God, remember what you told Moses. You told Moses that if we sin, you're going to judge us and you're going to take us out of the land. And yes, you have done that. And, and I, I, that's part of what you said you're going to do and you've done it and, and great. But he says, but you have said, if we repent... You will gather us again and bring us back to the land. So he says, remember this, God. And now I'm repenting. I am putting right before you. I'm putting my heart right before you. I'm repenting on behalf of my people. Now bring us back to the land. Act on our behalf. What this is saying is, friends, when you pray, pray the promises of God. Does not mean God has forgotten you, but remind him of your promises, the promises you have made. And you think, well, isn't that a bit too much? Listen to this, Isaiah 43, verse 26. God is speaking, and he says, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together, state your case that you may be acquitted. God is saying, let Listen, you, you all have sinned, but remember, I promise that if you repent, that I will forgive you. Now remind me of that. In other words, claim that promise and let's contend. Let's talk about this because I have a plan and a purpose to, to get you out of this situation. Isaiah is not suggesting God is lacking memory or needing a reminder. But God is saying, claim my promises in persistent, faithful prayer. That's what it means. You know, many years ago, uh, as a family, we were praying for my father's salvation. Uh, my mother, uh, more than anyone else, prayed for his salvation. Every day she would pray for his salvation. And the thing is this, my father... Um, we prayed and we got some promises from God and words from God about his salvation. One of the words I'll never forget is, while praying, what the, the Lord gave the family is, you and your household shall be saved. So we realized, listen, this is a promise for us. God is giving this promise to us as well, and this is going to happen for my father. But we also heard another word that someone spoke to us. And said, you know what? Your father is going to come to salvation. But as soon as he does, God is going to take him away. But the thing is this. For us, we wanted him saved more than anything else. So we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And I think my mother would have prayed for years, for decades. But every time we prayed and she prayed, we held on to the promises of God. And we prayed and we prayed, and we prayed, and at times it seemed that he was getting, going away from God. He didn't want anything to do with this God. And at one point when I was almost thinking, you know what, it's not happening. But nevertheless, let's just claim the promises of God when we pray. And we prayed, and one day I was, I'd come back. We'd been on a long trip. I'd driven the, uh, my mom and dad home, and we came back home, and I went up to my room, 
and I was just getting ready to sleep. When my mom walks into the room and says, listen, uh, you need to come. Your father wants you to call Pastor Leslie. And I'm like, why would he want to call Pastor Leslie? Pastor Leslie's on his way to Candy, halfway there. He was not halfway, he was near Kadavath or something. Um, and I called him and I said, listen, I think, you know, my father wants to speak to you. And he turned around and he came back because the Lord said, this is, this is going to be it. He came home. But one of the things, why, what I'm, why I'm telling you this story is when we didn't see God working, he was working. God was doing something in my father's heart that we'd not see. Because that day, he was a man who always believed that it was his parents, his dead parents, parents who were watching over him right and everything was that he was not a very religious person but that is something he held on to firmly but that day when my mother went into the room my father was praying for the very first time in his life and this was his prayer I know you I know who you are Get out in the name of Jesus. He'd been listening to us. And he, for some brief moment, the Lord just took the veil off his eyes. And he saw the evil that he was depending upon. And at that moment, he prayed in the name of Jesus for the very first time in his life. And as soon as Pastor Leslie came, he gave his heart to the Lord. And three days later, as was promised... He went to be with the Lord. God works according to his promises. Now, I would have definitely wanted God to do it in a different way. I mean, save him for sure, but keep him for much longer. But God has a plan and God has a purpose. And when you pray persistent, faithful prayers according to his promises and his covenant, you pray his purpose, his will be done, his kingdom come. Amen? And when you hold on to that, God does work. He remembers. God will never forget his promises over your life. And therefore, you never forget those promises over your life. A lot of the time, we forget. <clears throat> we throw them away. We think, you know, what's the point? It's never going to happen. So put that promise in the, in the garbage. It's not happening. Let's find another promise. And then we, we get that promise. And sometimes even that doesn't seem to be working. Well, I've waited long enough. Put that away. If I'm right, my mother wait, prayed for my father for something like 23 years. 23 years. How often she would have wanted to throw that promise away and say, God, it's never going to happen. So, you know what? I just accept that what's happening. No, my friends, God never forgets. And he calls you and me to call him to remembrance on the promises and the covenant promises that he has made for you in your life. Amen? Well, number two, God remembers our faithful work and walk. Put yourself in Noah's shoes. He was a man who was faithful. The Bible says Noah was found faithful. He was a man who walked with God. He was a man who was righteous in his time. And by the way, if you think our times are bad, back when Noah was, God thought it was so bad that he destroyed the world. He was a man who trusted God when everything seemed to be against him. He trusted God. He was faithful to God. And now he finds himself and his family afloat in the midst of a storm. For months on end, nothing is happening. Can you imagine the frustration? 
And, and by the way, he is living in that ark with hundreds, maybe thousands of animals. Now, some of you, I don't know what your conditions at home are, but this, in your conditions are not as bad as this, okay? You might, you might have people say, oh, you'd live like an animal? No, not like that. Okay, this was worse. These are real animals. And they were pretty bad and stinky. Can you imagine Noah's children and his in-laws and coming and his wife coming and saying, Noah, you put us on this boat, now what? It would have better to have died with the people than just floating around in the open, I mean, open waters. There's no harbor. There's nothing, nothing to even look at. Just water all around you. Can you imagine what would have gone through his mind? Has God forgotten? Has all my good work been for nothing? After all I did, I'm, I'm drift in a storm. But Genesis 8.1, but God remembered Noah. He will not forget. Friends, God does not forget your faithful work that you do for him in service to him. Now, that does not mean just doing service within the church uh, service. I'm talking about whatever service you do in the name of God. Okay, listen to this, Hebrews 6, 10 to 11. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and to minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. The writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, you might feel forgotten. You might feel nobody appreciates the work you're doing, that no one is saying anything about all you're doing. But I want to tell you, God does not forget. He remembers you. Some of you might be feeling like Noah right now. What am I achieving through this all? Maybe it's time to quit. Because... It almost seems like even God may have forgotten me. You know, I want to take a few moments just to thank some of the people who serve where no one sees what's happening or no one appreciates them. One of the people that I like to thank is Lulu. I mean, she is in that prayer room, sometimes all by herself praying for this service. I've walked in there sometimes to go and prepare, and she's there sitting there praying all by herself. Now she has a team who support her, of course, and thank you for them as well. But whether that team turns up or not, she's there praying. Last Sunday's service, the amount of prayer and support that she gave was tremendous. Now, no one knows that because that's, all she, that's what she does. She prays okay, and leads us in prayer. But remember, as the Apostle Paul said, that is the work. That is the greatest work you do in your service to God, is your prayer. I just want to thank our AV team at the back, behind that table, AV and sound and, and all that. They, they are there doing that work. And sometimes they don't get any thanks or any recognition. And, and not that they're asking for it either. And, and especially Radhika, you look at her and thank her and she'll give you that stare. And roll her eyes at you like, why? Why did you even mention my name? But it doesn't matter. God remembers. God remembers. God knows what they do. And all the work that they do to make these services available to people long after this service is over. Our coordinators, Shiana and Maria, I mean, the two of them are the ones who make sure that the temperature is right and when it's not right because half of the people think it's too cold and half of the people think it's too hot and half of the people think it's just perfect and they have to be running up and down, putting the, the, the AC up and down as you want and don't want and trying to please the whole church, which 
It's pretty impossible to do. I found that a long time ago. <laughs> but they do that. And we just want to appreciate and thank them. I want to thank our ushers. And remember our, our parking helpers. Remember them? They are inside here now because we have enough parking. But remember Nishan and Vishu and Amma back in, you know, in the, in the car park in the hottest days. They'd be standing out there. I think they liked it though. Okay, because they were very disappointed when we got more parking. They were like, oh no, we have to come inside. Yeah, but still. They're not forgotten. God remembers. See, I want you to understand that I don't think some of you will ever be thanked from up here because none like my wife. If I get my wife up here, she'll thank every one of you. Every single person sitting here today will get a thank you. But that's not me. But I want you to remember, you're not doing it for me. It is God who remembers. And he has not forgotten what you have done for him. Amen? Well, Psalm 106, verse 4 and 5 says, Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. O visit me with your salvation, that I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I might rejoice in the gladness of your nation, and that I may glory with your inheritance. Here's a man of God, a, a, a child of God, who's basically come to God and said, God, remember me. I'm also part of your family. I'm also part of the chosen ones, the ones you have chosen. I am, in other words, he's saying, I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a believer. I'm just bringing this to New Testament uh, terms. Remember me with the covenant promises that are also available to me. Because as I walk among your people, and as, as I'm part of the, these people, there are promises of God, covenant promises that belong to me. And he's saying, remember me. With those promises. Bring those promises to pass in my life. Remember. Galatians 6, 9 says, So it's so easy for us, friends, to get very discouraged in serving God. And that's why I think the Apostle Paul is even saying, don't get weary of well-doing. He's saying, listen, you're doing good. And sometimes even doing good causes us to get tired and discouraged and weary. And he's saying, don't allow that to happen. Because when you look at your circumstances, it's easy to get discouraged. And believe me, as a pastor, I know this. I know how difficult it is to keep myself encouraged serving God. Because often you don't see the results of what you have done or, res or any kind of Anything happening, you stand up here and preach and preach and preach and teach and do all those things. And sometimes you're wondering, is it even getting through? By the way, I know it is. But it is discouraging at times. And it's very easy to feel, you know, what's the point of all this? At least when I was doing medicine, you give the medicine and the person either gets bad or good, you know. <laughs> You know what your medicine is doing. It's working or not working. Here you don't know. Is it working? Is it not working? Because some of you are just looking at me like, I don't know whether it's working. I don't know whether it's not working. But remember that God remembers. You know, I've shared this story with you, but it kind of fits in, so I'm going to share it again. So too bad to those of you who know. I was, when Nirosha and I were in Kandy, we started a ministry for, or we got, this one guy got saved, he was an A-level student in Trinity College, he got saved, and then he said, um, why don't you come and we'll start a Bible study in the school and we will, I'll invite my friends, so they were all boarders, so on Sundays they were in the school and, and for them it was a real treat, more than anything, because Nirosha would always give them food when they came. So not boarding food, they got home-cooked food, and, and for that, they came. Whether they wanted to hear what I had to say or not, that was a whole different thing. But they came for the food. 
And we had to travel quite far to keep coming and ministering to them because we, I served, I worked in a place called Bokkavala, which was like quite far away. And we would come and do this every week. And at the, almost at the end of their time, okay, when they were coming to sit for their A-levels or whatever, the main guy, the guy who got saved first and invited his friends, just went completely off. To the point that, I mean, I didn't know, his, his father took him out of school and sent him to the Middle East, I don't know why, uh, to sort him out. And when that happened, everything fell apart. And I was sitting there thinking, you know what, what's the point? What did we do? What did we achieve? We traveled every week up and down and did all these things, nothing, no results. But I just put that down to a failure in our lives, and we kept going. And almost 15 years later, okay, this was like when Aaron was about two years old, maybe about 24 years ago. Uh, about 15 years later, I was in a place uh, in Madampe, okay, a place called uh, Vigro. And it was one of our conventions, and I was coming, finishing, and we were walking to the vehicle, uh, Pastor Dinesh and Vishu were with me, and these two guys came up and, and went running to Pastor Dinesh and said, are you Ramesh Bulat Singhala? And when you get two young people asking that, you, you are very scared because you're thinking, what have I done? <laughs> and, and he, without saying, I don't know who he is, he pointed me out and said, no, that's Ramesh Bulat Singhala. So then these two guys come to me and said, are you? So I'm like, yeah, why? And he said, do you know this person? And this was the person who I thought had, you know, his father took him out and all that. And I said, yes. He said, we just wanted to find you to thank you. I'm like, okay, now I want to listen. And he was like, he came back from the Middle East. And he d discipled us and mentored us. And we are serving God today because of him. But he always told us it's the impact that you had on his life that made him this way. And I was like, wow, God remembers. And it's not that God is saying, oh, I remember what you did. It's he works in that situation. So Malachi 3.16 says, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Wow. Remember I said that your walk and your, sorry, your work and your walk. It's saying there's a book of remembrance, Malachi is saying, where God remembers your walk with him. And he says, if you feared the Lord and walked in the fear of the Lord, and if you spoke about him with one another and shared about him, God remembers you. Friends, in these days and times when the world is drifting away, becoming more and more evil and unrighteous, when what is good is called evil and what is evil is called good, you and I are called to walk in the fear of the Lord. Not to bend, not to compromise, not to accept evil. And God will remember you, is what the Bible says. And finally, God remembers our tears and our pain. Psalm 56 verse 8. The psalm is speaking to God, says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. The psalmist says God collects and tracks your pain and your tears and your sorrow in his book. The book of remembrance that Malachi talked about. He tracks your tears and your sorrows and remembers them. You know, in 1 Samuel 1, 10 to 11, 
talks about Hannah. Hannah was a woman who went through a lot of grief and sorrow. She was being bullied by her husband. Elkanah was married to two, had two wives. She was one of them, and, and the other one was bullying her. The other one's name was what, Penina or something like that. I think she could have been bullied for her name, but she was bullying Hannah for some reason. How that happened, I don't know. But it's because she didn't have children. And she was in great sorrow and great anguish. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 1, 10 to 11, she prayed with great sorrow and anguish. And this is what she says, God, remember me. God, remember me. And once again, she's not saying, God, you know, one day just, just have a passing thought for me. She say, no, God, act on my behalf. Give me a child. Look upon my pain and act on my behalf is what her prayer is. And the Bible tells us that God remembered her or God blessed her with a child and then several children after that. When it says God remembers, it uh, remembers your pain and suffering. It does not mean that he looks at me and says, Oh, Ramesh, I remember the day that you broke your hip. Oh, that must have been pretty painful. I remember that. I remember the day you lost your father. Well, that would have been pretty sad. Yep, I remember that as well. No, it means God acts to turn your sorrow into joy. He works through your pain, through your suffering, through your tears. John 16, 20 is truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. He says, what's happening to you now is not the end of the story. Your story is still being written. And your sorrow will be turned to joy. Today you're going through hardship and pain. But God is saying, I remember you. I'm working in that situation. I'm working. And one of the stories that touches my heart every single time is found in 2 Samuel 14, 14. And let me quickly tell you this story. David is going through a severe calamity, disaster in his family. His daughter Tamar was raped by his, her half-brother Amnon. And then David did nothing about it. So his other son Absalom hears about it and he goes and kills Amnon. So David has one child who had been uh, abused, another child who's been killed, and another child who he has to banish. His family is falling apart. He is in tremendous sorrow and sadness. And in 2 Samuel 14, 14, this woman from Tekoa comes to him and she, uh, gives him this word. He says, all of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. He says, listen, our lives are like water. When it's spilled on the ground, all it's good for is to be swept away. It's good for nothing. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. What he's saying is this. God does not waste your pain your sorrow, and your suffering. He works, and he works through them to bring about redemption and healing and blessing. And some of you all are looking at your pain and suffering and thinking, how in the world can God turn this situation around? But that's why he's God. He can do things that you and I can never dream of or expect. Last Sunday, we heard two testimonies from Shehan and Noah. Two lives that had been absolutely almost destroyed. But two lives that God just turned around and blessed. And last Sunday, they were up here sharing about what God has done in their lives. I 
I just want to pray before we partake of communion. And I want to pray for three, three categories of people, and you might find yourself in all three of them. But I want you to respond to the one that you, are, you fall into. I want you to think about it. And the first is, I want to pray for you. Um, and I want you, actually, I want you to pray. And bring to remembrance the promises that God have ma has made in your life that have still to be fulfilled. What are those promises? What is God telling you? What are the promises that he has made in your life? And you are saying, you know what, God? I don't know whether these things will ever come to pass. I want you to know that God remembers. So first, I want you to pray. And I want you to say, God... Remember, remember the promise that you made to me. Lord, remember your covenant with your children. Lord, act on my behalf. Lord, don't leave me drifting in the waters. Lord, remember your promise. Remember what you have said. And Lord, bring that to pass in my life. Secondly, I just want to pray for those who uh, need a breakthrough in your life, whether it be healing or whether it be a financial breakthrough or something like that, and you've been praying and you're becoming even discouraged, thinking God is not hearing you. I want to pray for you, but this time I want you to stand up where you are so that we can pray for you. If you need a breakthrough, a, 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 you know, a healing or something like that, would you just stand up where you are right now so we can pray for you? There are a couple of people standing, so if, yeah, if you can, if there are any more, stand up quickly so that we can pray for you. Okay, those of you who are near them, okay, I'll give you just a couple of minutes more for anyone else who would like to stand up. Okay, if you are near them, can you go up to them and lay hands on them and pray with them? And pray that God will remember them. God, remember them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
I want to pray for one final group of people. You're here today, and I know this is a bit of a difficult one, and you might even feel, well, I don't want to really respond to this in public. Friends, remember, this is family. Okay? And those around you want to pray for you and support you in your, in your challenges. And this is who I want to pray for. For those here today, if you're feeling sad, in pain, or discouraged, if you're here today and you're, you're feeling really discouraged and you've done everything you need to do, but you're just feeling that maybe nothing's coming through, nothing is happening, and you're feeling discouraged, or if you're carrying a lot of sadness or even physical pain for some reason, uh, I'd like you to stand up where you are and I will pray for you. Yeah. If you're close to them, please go up to them and lay hands on them and I will pray. There's someone in the back as well, so if somebody goes all the way back. And if you're here today and you're saying, listen, I feel discouraged, I feel all this, but I'm just not in the mood to stand up, that's okay. Let me pray for you as well. Father, I just come before your throne of grace. And Lord, sometimes it's so easy to get discouraged in well-doing. Father, as we live in this world full of challenges, full of assaults upon our soul, it's so easy to get hurt, to feel rejected, to feel abandoned, to feel betrayed. Father, I bring them before you today. Lord, I also pray for those who are feeling a physical pain in their bodies, oh God, right now. 